Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Thank you for joining us for Publishing in Transit today. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 908th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and today I have the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation and reading featuring Stephen Motika, Lindsay Bolt, Gia Gonzalez, and Cole Swenson. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host, Stephen Motika is the author of Western Practice and the chapbooks Arrival and At Mono in the Madrones and Private Archive. His articles and poems have appeared in Bomb and the Brooklyn Review, among others, and he is the director and publisher of Nightboat Books. Lindsay Bolt is the author of Weirding, Overboard, and several chat books, including Titties for Lindsay and There Are No Cops in America and The Streets Are Paved with Cheese. With Steve Orth, she writes plays and teaches poets theater workshops. She is the editorial director of Night Boat Books. Gia Gonzalez is a poet based in New York City. Her work has most recently appeared in Based, Femscapes, B Bomb Cyclone, and vari variously with the Poetry Project. Her first chapbook, Render Sleeves, was published by Portable Press at Yo-Yo Labs. She is the managing editor at Night Boat Books. And our host today is Cole Swenson. Cole is the author of 17 volumes of poetry and a collection of critical essays called Noise That Stays Noise. A book of hybrid poem essays called Art in Time was published by Night Boat in 2021. A former Guggenheim fellow, she has been a finalist for the National Book Award and has been awarded the Iowa Poetry Prize, the SF State Poetry Center Book Award, and the National Poetry Series. She has also translated over 20 volumes of poetry, prose, and art criticism from French and won the 2004 Penn USA Award in Literary Translation. Super, super grateful to have you all here today in conversation about Nightboat. And with that, I'll just pass it over to Cole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eleanor and Chloe and everyone at the rail, uh, Fong especially for making this possible. This is the publishing in transit uh, section of the new social environment. And we do this just to honor all the amazing people who do the work that gets poetry out there to us. And, and often these people are not recognized nearly enough. So we wanted to do this to, to talk with them and make them more available. So let's get started with some readings. And we're gonna hear from Lindsay Bolt first. Thanks, Lindsay. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here. I uh, thanks to the Brooklyn Rail and to Eleanor and Chloe and Cole. Really stoked to be here to talk with my beloved co-worker Stephen and Gia. Um, so I'm just gonna read some poems from a new manuscript that I'm calling uh, Tripper. Beware the easy little slutty little poem who opens up quick and wants to be enjoyed they said, you can't trust the easy little, slutty little poem. Sure, it makes you laugh, forget your troubles, but if you're not careful, it'll suck you in to its sticky void, that dirty little, slutty little poem. My therapist says the phrase small p psychosis, and I hug its diminutive size, near normal or next to, small enough to fit inside my house, small enough to rarely show. Few moments of giant shoes and giant hands seen bursting through windows, kept under the hat, so to speak. Still high, always and forever, on permanent astral layaway, sky fam tugging my sleeve. Remember us or else. Humans without context tend to break apart upon expansion. I am one of these. 
to overcome an overwhelming feeling, an overwhelming feeling of being overcome, the coming on of overwhelming feeling, the dissolution of self into overwhelming feeling, an overwhelming feeling of dissolution of self. Having one's shit together means not being dispersed, means not being dissolved. How to dissolve the self and return to work on Monday. How to refuse the transition, how to slide between modes. Work to buy the pants to express the self, recoup the losses of the week. Drugs and forests stimulate a little ego death. Return and feel thyself. I'm thinking about how not to be a piece of shit, a single turd, when we are all one massive cow splat laid on the wide open field. I keep writing the same poem, but conditions haven't changed. So why would the poem? I'll keep writing the same poem until conditions change. New York, October 2022. Holly gives me a tiny monster truck, the crusher. The crusher turns my hand into a giant. The crusher wants me to recognize my size. The crusher says, you're not so different from yourself. New York is an overwhelm I hope to ride. Stay within yourself, say the athletes, this collection of cells. I left all my crystals at home, so this tiny truck will have to do. Here I am a small creature out of my burrow, hippity hopping as rabbit, slowly trundling as hedgehog down the garden path. I could be a shining blade unsheathed. Oh, Excalibur, behold my brilliance, and you, my dear, who is a woodland creature too. How do you survive in the wide world? What folds you along? Reanimate like sponge critter under the tap, sponge critter in pill form unfolding, dissolve the pill casing to reveal the self, alligator, elephant, kangaroo, squirrel, allow me likewise to unfurl, coalesce into form or elsewise spread to exist, both actions necessary if one more familiar than the next, a different action space. An overwhelming feeling of tenderness towards humanity on the G train. Amidst more people than trees, I begin to sense our species shape and movement, contour. No big thoughts about how or what to do, just that we exist as a flow, like lava or mud. I like to feel myself a drop in the falls. A Bartable Enya Afternoon. Indeed, the whimsy is bright upon the water, the bay. Creatures of comfort, creatures of pain, crawl restless under the skin, a lock-jawed bull, ferret of flame and levity, shrimps and weasels, a badger at the brow, group discontent in the orca pod, having lived and lived seemingly incessantly, the not stopping, that's impressive. Irredeemable whimsy, again, for emphasis, a purposeless expressive expression of joy next to a purposeful expression of pain. Deep in the guts, a shudder, a growl, a hoisting up. Fifty years ago, there was no tunnel tube under the bay. Mean to say even guts are temporary, have lingered out of curiosity and stubbornness, cranking out an absurdity into a crowd of absurdities. Damask rose, chloroform, galadriel, epistemology, rapturous stinging mystery, strike life from every line, replace with mystery. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And we'll pass it to Stephen Motika, please. Thanks. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Anor and Chloe. Thank you, Lindsay. I love that poem that you just ended with. And I'm so glad to be here with you. And of course, Gia. And I'm going to read uh, one poem and then a short fragment of something that reminds me of when Lindsay and I started working together. You could say of me, he would show you his map, 
Ed Dorn. A tonic, blue plinth, where's your mother? In hello, it's Oakland. A coarse temperament, an allocative missive. Me, an envelope with antelope. The hills, bone dry, but gorgeous. A, ca a canal is not a marker for the human breath. Trains can take us places slowly, little snails. I won't write this word again. The ginger man, the professor, flight of process, repetitive names, counting with some sense of momentum. Homosexuals on street corners, underscore, the underscore. Did it become true? The constellation glitters, Robert Duncan. I don't think I saw the man as relevant, no broom, yellow or lavender, now no shade. I think of surface and of places held, our fingers slipping from embankment's ledge, roots supple, a howling cloud so as to be unusable. I collected the last in passage to cup, come into change. We frequent, written, and walled. I too terrify the injunction. Why me and my kind? The topos of calendars groaning, still waiting for foxes, kits. The myth, supine and glaze of water, expectation, a strangeness, large. Why make me? Naked between streets, the long fourth path to underbush, canyon. And join mouths in fantasy. I told you to fuck off. Does loving hate, destructive pass, and pleasure strip shale and sounds flap a fragment? Adobe cottonwood phase of photos, years of territory. Plateau, southwest and skip the rain in wet cake. And love fighting out, Leslie Scalabino. Come on, cycle in air, piper into foam bed, dune sprout, patent tent. The 80s of your childhood burned a fire in the brain, the pen torched a page, so the great emptiness, fearful centers landed within. Some, a recommendation at noon, the sleep of light. With a vacancy, a marionette for the father, a capacious loon, of course, chopping with knife, peninsular, a cavalry for holding an atmosphere. Stereoscopic, shaded, but my own mountain views enclose a tensile alphabet. So that the dust is up, like register, cat with a cat claw, scrape stars and linguistic revelation. Revolution? I know no monk, just a moment. Glad climbs, chemise, the ranch land creeks, amethyst with thirst. The mountains in your country, the flat skies of mine, a Mary Baraka. The under, carve a lettered scratch. When this, in this way, maybe entering thought of the late winter day, white sun in wet sentences, some experimental wave, a populace of veins, a green mist and refutation burns at things inside it. Lunation of trees, recipes, and a bang. What pre-war trade ground round did you tread? What airings? Some comments on capacity as impression of what's impossible? A crumbling pod? No. A sand something sail? Maybe. Acidic, relish sidewalks and hickory. I'll be found as a consequence of compounds. A motion hat marks the theater from ceiling to door to wish a new curtain, wheels, blend instruction, wrap figures far from the mirror. A Pullman napkin, wipe me down. And then I just want to read a little tiny bit that um, I wrote when we were working with John Kiger, Lindsay and I, on the reissue of her journals of, from Japan and India. How do we write about the world? I know our ancestors once belonged to countries that tried to wipe each other, tried to wipe each other out entirely. How do you figure what's all in the past? What's the future of the minute? Rain, then drought, then rain. The reservoir filled this January, a green behind the long mountain slope. Reading, we remember those pasts. Up the coast in 1957, San Francisco, a poet's town, Spicer and the Pink Hippo. Writing and writing, few women writing long poems, now or then. You notice the blue, moving very carefully now. No more coming home for sleep, the advantage of dream, of dream space. Buzz, 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 going out and last nights again. Who are these useless men? Food, they are food. The wonderful focus of you. My dreams, time is a nice thing to go through. The rest, 
its longest pause is a funny breath. I drove north, return in plans, ocean up, described the scene looking out. I took you into the dark design, redwood and pine, to land in light, cruising for nectar, browsing, but anxious to get home. Are you here? Thanks. Thank you both. I feel like that really got us started with the poetry and gives us momentum. So let's go now to some images that I think you've got. And we'd love to hear about them and a little bit about the history and the activities. That's a great one to start with. Yes. So this was our reading at Word is Change last spring, um, spring 23 in Brooklyn, celebrating uh, five authors with um, new Nipo books, Imogen Christian Smith on the left, author of Stemmy Things, Andrea Abikaram, author of Villainy, Emily Luan, author of Return, and then Wo Chan's Togetherness. And on the far right, we have Dior J. Stevens with Cruel Cruel. And so it's a fun, uh, wonderful bookstore in Bedford Stuyvesant and one of our the community events we got to work on. And um, we had a great turnout and uh, fun was had by all. Is this at oh, is this at the bookstore in Seattle during AWP? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that's this DR. is at Arendell Books. It's, yeah. That looks AWP like a offsite event. Yeah. Emily and Emily Lila Wan at AWP. Yeah, she was signing books. There's Paloma. Our operations assistant. This is at the Penn World Voices Book Fair in New York in spring. That's Lena Bergamini, our publicist, standing with Wayne Kestenbaum at the New York Art Book Fair in the fall 2022. Hey, Gabriel, signing a Queen in Bucks County, also at the same art book fair. And Stephen, you're in the background there. There I am, yeah. <laughs> Doing something. <laughs> yep. This was, oh yeah, this was exciting because we, so many of us had never met in person. Mm -hmm. um, so we're spread out across the country. And now we have um, our design coordinator kit is in Mexico. So we were very excited to be in the same room together last fall. With yeah, I had off. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I was okay, just saying yeah. that I hadn't met Trisha before in person, and possibly not you either, Lindsay. I'm not sure. Um, I think we'd we'd seen each other a couple times that week, but before that, oh we yeah, never met in person. Right. So our staff is pretty spread out. So I think we have folks on um, in the Bay Area, and I think a lot of us are based in New York. Kits in Mexico, and uh, I think um, Santi. Deanna now and in Mexico. Um, yeah, Jay Elizabeth is in Mexico. Albuquerque and our editorial fellow Naima uh, is in Mexico too. And this was so. this is our Greenpoint office, which as you can see is mostly a lot of books. And um Trisha Lowe is on the left, editor at large, and then Lena uh, introduced in the middle, and then Rissa Hockberger in the light yellow shirt, who is our design and production coordinator did a lot of really beautiful books. And then there's Gia. Yeah, very flattering image. <laughs> and, and there I we are. It, <laughs> I call this one Goss on the couch. Gia and Trisha. Yeah, there's definitely some <laughs> Goss going on, I'm sure. <laughs> I love the arm and the hands and the fingers showing up. Like <laughs> yeah. other people. <laughs> yeah. That's a AWP in Seattle. Yeah. After it was all over. <laughs> yeah, we survived, made it through. This is this a, in the office again. Yeah. And, and I don't uh, think. Kaylin, ahead, no, Kaylin Ardone on the far right was um, 
our director of publicity until early this year. And they, um, they're now Grey Wolf Press, but this, they were our, on our staff then. Another beautiful image of me. I think this is <laughs> from when we were talking about um, planning our um, uh, BIPOC editorial um, fellowship. Um, and I don't know why we might have been using like a tarot card to help us like to help steer yeah. the conversation yeah. I think at this point yeah Jay is re pulling cards for yeah. <laughs> we were we met like every week for months mm -hmm. like over the course of a year um Gia and I started out and then Trisha joined us and then Jay joined us and it was like I don't know. I looked forward to it every week. It's really fun. And um, but this was the deliberation between the yes, right. We had the some final. like incredible this was, yeah. final finalists, and um, yeah, we were like, it was just it was a tough call. But then we, I mean, Naim is incredible, so we I'm very happy how it turned out. But in in fact. Uh, that would make a great segue to talk about that editorial fellowship and what the fellow does and how it's run and et cetera. So if you'd like to address that, I was thinking also uh, of the internship program. It seems there's so many things that you do reaching out to other people and bringing people into your community. So tell us about it. I can start and then maybe Gia, you can sure. chime in because we were we started out working on this together I don't know that would have been like almost two years ago and mm -hmm. um the, I, the idea for the editorial fellowship kind of came through COSM but also just you know out of the uprisings in 2020 around George Floyd's death and just feeling like uh you know it's you never really know how to respond within your arts organization, but wanting to just think about um, structural racism within publishing and um, how to create more access um, to to editorial work in particular. Um, and so we, we wanted to create a fellowship, particularly for, um, for BIPOC editors and, um, so we we but we didn't want to, you know, we want didn't want to replicate existing um, forms of of fellowship or, or or I don't know how to say it. Like we were, felt a little critical of some of the um, what do you like DEI initiatives that were existing. So we we did a lot of research and interviews over the course of a year. Um, just talking to community members um, in the field to get a sense of what, you know, it's really needed um, rather than, you know, having our idea about what should happen, trying to get a sense of what people really, what the needs were. So that that was sort of the the groundwork um, for the, that we did at first. Yeah, do you want to say more about the, yeah. no, I, the I think... fellowship itself? Yeah, you know, I, th I think something that I'm, I've, like, you know, been thinking about is, you know, publishing can sort of feel like a pretty, like, gate-kept industry, and then, uh, you know, edit, like, editorial is sort of, like, the, the center of the, <laughs> of the, like, the gate within the gate, um, and so I think that was part of what we were thinking about, um, you know, I have, I think, like, when I was first starting out, um, when I graduated college, like, I, I was, um, I was part of like a, a publishing like DEI initiative at like a larger publishing house to you know um, for and, and and you know I think there are some sort of obvious like I think pitfalls and also like great things to have come out of that but I think that when Lindsay and I were sort of initially and and all of the staff at night but we're sitting to sitting down and thinking about it yeah as, as Lindsay said we definitely didn't want this to be like a sort of like surface level kind of like like representational like politic like I think it was really important to us that you know we we, we felt that in like the ways that in in, in, the, in in all of the ways that we were thinking about the fellowship and like the material ways we were supporting the fellow like that 
you know, this was like a really like that that this was an opportunity that was meaningful and that actually granted like people access. So I think like part of that was making sure that like just just considering like, you know, the 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 pay, um, which, you know, we got a great uh grant from um an organization. I think they're they've rebranded since, but they were called Lit Tap at the time. What is it now, Stephen? Yeah, Litness. Yeah. Oh, Litness. Uh-huh. They gave it. They. I mean, and I'll just say, part of what Lindsay and Gia and Trisha and Jay did is this incredible listening tour. So yeah. the grant helped fund the research, and I thought that was a brilliant insight to take the time to do it right and really talk to people in the field, editors of color, uh, publishers of color, uh, writers of color who had been through these experiences and really had feedback. And as Lindsay and Gil were saying, what is the end result? A transparent process. And how could we as a very small press in the big world of publishing and nonprofits actually make an impact and actually give some, what could we offer that others couldn't offer? And, um, and that honing down to, well, let's give someone an opportunity to really make a book, to pub- mm-hmm. the, a book that Nightbook would publish and and produce and disseminate and publicize. And um, and that's what we felt in addition to a stipend of $10,000 over two years, which in the scheme of things is not that much money, but for a poetry uh, project, it's it's quite, and of a press of our size, it's, it's, a, it's a significant. Yeah. And I think, you know, we wanted to be like cognizant of sort of both sides of that. And, you know, I think just like in terms of how we were con- like conceptualizing the program, you know, part of that was recognizing like, you know, this is, this is a, it's a good amount of money, but it's not going to be enough to like support somebody entirely. So, you know, making sure that the program was, I, I think at the beginning, there was almost like a little bit of like the same morphous, like this, there was a little bit of like a kind of like, like, uh, what's the word like I guess I guess uncertainty because um you know I think I think the fellow was sort of like well like when do you need when do you need me to be to be present at night boat and we were like well when when are you available you know um and, and I think just really wanting to make sure that we were working around you know like the actual sort of like material limitations of like of the fellow's life um and now um yeah we we had three really great our four really great finalists that we were um, interviewing, all of whom had come to the table with like completely different like ideas um, and, and and yeah, different ideas and, and and life experiences and thoughts about where they wanted to take the fellowship. And now we are working with um, this amazing uh, fellow, um, uh, Naima Yale Tokuno. And um, I, I, it's sort of amusing to me because, you know, working in um, working with managing, like as a managing editor and working with like Lindsay and Steven, like we've worked on a few anthologies and we know that, you know, anthologies in particular are like a lot of work. Um, and so Naima showed up and was like, I really want to do an anthology. And we were like, well, like it is a lot of work. Like, are you sure? <laughs> you know? And, and she really just sort of like, I mean, it, it's been like almost <laughs> like it, it's, it's been, it's been kind of amazing just to see like how really on top of it she is and um, the kind of perspective that she's coming uh, to the anthology with, which, which I don't think is something that, you know, that I don't, I don't think it's something we've done before. It, it's a very like curatorial kind of like vision with like a sort of like curator's statement, you know, it, it, it's, it's really cool. Um, it's about the archive and, um, in, and many different kinds of facets of the archive and the archival. Yeah. And she's oh. bringing this, like, it's really important to her to sp- to have a mix of solicited work and just, and she wanted to do an open reading period and mm-hmm. she has a strong value on publishing work by, you know, unknown or uh, little recognized um, writers. Like she didn't want to rely on work, you know, people whose work she was already familiar with or we were already familiar with, just trying to reach outside those gates again and um, bring more people in. Um, which so that's been really exciting to see. And she just is like, I've adopted her spreadsheet system to <laughs> man- manage our reading periods. Cause I'm just like, this is so brilliant. Wow. So she's just like this I incredible they- mix of like wildly incredible, like expansive vision, like conceptual, theoretical vision and practical um, ability. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we often look at her in the meetings like, are you sure you don't want to just take everything over? <laughs> like you, I mean, and we're talking 600 submissions that 
Naima read with one of our editors at large and spreadsheets with comments. And it, it's just a phenomenal amount of work that's happened in a, just a few months. It's going to be a really exciting book. And maybe we should drop a link for, um, she did a wonderful interview for our blog. And oh, there's yeah, some that's a good great idea. information. I can, I can drop that for people. Great. Well, that sounds like it is going to be an amazing book. Um, we will all be keeping an eye out. Um, and I was thinking also about the internship, which I imagine that's a very different program. I, I'd love to hear some more about that. Maybe I'll take that because um, that's sort of core to the New York operation. Uh, we have a lot of work that happens on the operational side, on publicity and marketing. You saw pictures of book fairs and book parties and the intern um, it's just really valuable in, in making the New York office go. We have a wonderful uh, new fall intern, Emily Barkbrown, who's got a lot of great experience in publishing and um, brought in the new Chicago Review this morning with its dossier on small press publishers. And we learned we were considered one of the bigger independent presses along with Grey Wolf. Yeah. Um, so, and the, so the work of just like Lena Bergamini runs the New York office and is an amazing colleague and keep so many balls in the air. We'll be at the Brooklyn Book Fest this Sunday. So stop by, the weather looks gorgeous. And um, we're, we're, we're doing Segway um, again and, and Lena and the intern uh, do all that as well as Kia um, and our other New York staff, Dante Silva, who was a publicity fellow, is now our publicity assistant and Paloma um, St. Denis Lopez, who um, was an intern and is now our operations assistant. So keeping all the pieces moving and, and engaged and um, that sort of New York hands-on training, uh, nuts and bolts of publishing to larger like research projects and editorial projects. The interns also support Lindsay and Gia with proofing and copy editing. I also really think that learning to write a pitch letter, learning to talk about things like experimental poetry to a general reader is a great exercise. So we try to give interns experiences like that. Um, and they also are invited to our editorial tables, um, our editorial meetings, which Lindsay can talk about. And um, we really try to just give them, they're really invited to, to every aspect of, of the press's operations. And we always like to say, yes, we need help with these things, but if there's something you're interested in working on or learning or leaning into, we'd love to, we'd love to support you in that. You mentioned the editorial process, and uh, I think most of us get the book and it's already done, and we aren't aware of the lengthy process that goes through from everything from how do you find the manuscripts? How do you get those? How do you make your choices? And how are different people involved? Um, I can take that, and then I'd love to hear again uh, Stephen's thoughts too, but... Yeah, I mean, we have the sort of like uh, official channels where, you know, like the we have our prose reading period, which we're reading for right now. We do that every other year um, because we wanted to expand from poetry to, to include experimental prose. And we've got some incredible books that have come through that process that we never would have found otherwise. Uh, UK author Hannah Levine, her book Grease Paint came in through the, the last prose period. Um, and Marcus Clayton's book on um, uh, on punk on um, on punk scenes in uh, Southern California came through that process, and so so that's been really exciting because that again like reaches outside of our direct circles and what we're interacting with. Um, and then we have our poetry prize, which we do annually, and um, that is another way that we we find manuscripts that we wouldn't have found otherwise. And um, that's an incredible thing. Like we get, you know, around like 900 manuscripts a year, something like that. And so our founder, Cosm, used to read these manuscripts like by himself sometimes, like all of them, which is just incredible. Uh, it's just like a Herculean effort. But now we have this process where we have like, yeah, we have six screeners, they're broken into groups of three. So each, every manuscript gets two reads. And then we have, you know, we narrow it down from there and then staff read 
um, in a second round, narrow it down, and then everyone on staff reads um, the last 10 or so, and that's, and we decide. Um, and a lot of our decision making ultimately comes down to who wants to edit the book. We really want um, someone, ideally more than one, but um, someone on staff to fall in love with the book and to carry it through the process and do all of the, you know, emotional labor and um, just, you kind of have to have heart, <laughs> you have to have a heart connection with these books, I think, um, to, because it's a lengthy process. It's like two years from when we acquire, sometimes longer, um, from when we acquire to when it's published. Um, and so we, uh, we, we have, you know, these discussions as a staff uh, around these reading periods, but we also have monthly editorial meetings where we bring manuscripts that um, have come in through other, like that we've solicited um, or that have come in through queries. Uh, often, you know, we're out there going to readings and reading our, um, and we'll just get, excited but I'm curious about something and bring it to the group. Um, I started out in publishing, uh, you know, I had zero, you know, I didn't get to touch the acquisitions process, you know, it was very much like I received the book and then I did sort of the hands-on practical managing ed work. And so I, I really, it's important to me that everyone who works for Nightboat gets to have a say in what we're publishing so that when you're working on the book you have you feel a connection to it and you're not just executing someone else's vision um so and it's been really fun to mentor young editors and like see people edit their first book and um so it yeah with the editorial meetings a lot of the discussion is around uh who would want to edit this? How would you edit this? What would be your approach? Um, um, and then, you know, there's always just a lot of figuring out like where it fits in our list. And sometimes we have to make some really, really tough calls because we would like to publish more than we do, but we, you know, we have limitations. So uh, that's a bit of a rambling answer. I don't know if Stephen and Gia, you want to say more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been really interesting since we've worked together for seven plus years now to go from doing a lot of everything to really letting go of editorial. And I think like Lindsay and I, I'll speak for myself, like really letting wonderful, brilliant new editors, um, part of the editorial team, you know, step up and engage and learn with Lindsay and bring their brilliant selves to the books. And I, it's been such a wonderful experience to watch. Um, Gia, Santi, Jay, and um, Kaylin, and among Lee. others, Lena, mm -hmm. um, among others, working on books. Yeah, and I love, I love that that is a is a, a rolling process. Um, and like we have projects in our next editorial meeting that are from from all the other staff members, and I I think I have one, but like I love it when it's just all these people who have come to help grow the editorial vision. And um, and I think that I've learned so much, I will say from the process and Lindsay's leadership in developing um, this process and Lindsay as a mentor and um, and as a teacher, not teacher, but a mentor. And, and I just, I wanna thank you for it because it's been, uh, it's been humbling and really, really, really an incredible process to witness. Yeah, I just, I, I really have to say that Lindsay and Stephen have been like amazing mentors. <laughs> um, you know, I, I started at Night Boat in 2021. Um, I don't think I necessarily had any expectations of like editing a book, um, but I got to edit, uh, it was Chal and Chang's book Prescribey, which came out um, last year. Um, and I felt like totally like out of my depth. And I was like, you know, I, I, I think out of my depth in the sense of like, well, first I'd never done it before, but then also I think just like, I have this like, uh, like, just this like total full body like panic about wanting to do a really good job by people and, um, and, and, and make sure that like, people feel like their work is like being, you know, taken care of and like heard and seen and like, you know, respected and, 
um, that people feel like they can have a sort of like, you know, have a fruitful generative dialogue with me. Um, and I think um, Lindsay and Stephen have been like very, have been such good like cheerleaders for me in that process. I, I think the, with, with my last editorial letter, like Stephen called me and was like, it's not going to be as good as you want it to be. Like, like I, I know that you're not going to be happy with it, but you have to like let it go because like you can't just be like you can't basically saying like you like trying to get me to like move out of this like perfectionistic mindset. Um, but like just like it's, like things like that, or just being able to like talk to Lindsay or Stephen, um, you know, kind of behind the scenes and 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 talk about these sort of like I don't know, like very like specific editorial questions that I have and that are so like you know so specific to each author that I'm you know working with I I feel really really grateful for that and um yeah and and, and I do think that it does foster the sense of like I think buy-in from everybody on the staff just like this like as, as Lindsay said it really people feel really feel connected to the work I mean I know I do and I I um I also think it's really like you know I I, I appreciate um Lindsay and Stephen's like willingness to um, make the editorial process more you know of this more of a collective effort because I think it's also just so like I think everyone is coming to the table with such different kinds of you know aesthetic like poetic preferences um and it, it's it's fun to get a book um you know at uh to read to discuss at ed table and go like oh this is like this is a Lindsay book or like, or when Kaylin was here, I remember there were some books where I was like, this is a Kaylin book <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> or, or, and vice versa. You know, I, I remember like, like Lindsay and Steven telling me like, oh, like there's this great, there's this great book. It just came in. Like, I think of you, you know, Steven said the same thing to me and I read it and I was like, I do love it, <laughs> you know? Um, so it, it's, I think that's also kind of a fun part of the like editorial collective process. Yeah, it's like, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses and blind spots, mm -hmm. and it can feel really like a lot of pressure to cover the field or something or to like to really be aware of everything. And that's just not a realistic expectation of any single person. But as a collective, as a group, we can we can do more and push outside of our comfort zones and um, yeah, it's so exciting to see people take things on and and there are so many books where I'm like, this is great, but I would I don't know what to do with it. And mm -hmm. then to see someone just transform something, you know, with the author and to have a vision for something that I, I couldn't see. It's so exciting. Um, and the long and process of the book that and maybe we'll look at the the slides of some of the images, but not just the editorial but the design, but the like how it continues to have to be cared for. And there are a couple books on the slideshow that like, yeah, just, they were very, they had certain challenges on the managing mm -hmm. side that I think just go to show like long after the editorial letter is done, there's questions, you know, from trim mm -hmm. size to, um, you know, what's the cover gonna be and never mind marketing and, and promotion and publicity. Yeah, Giet, just to say, Giet is such an incredible editor I, from at every stage of the process. Like, I don't know. I just, I, I don't know if I can even articulate it. It's just like this incredible precision and like vision. So then, you know, from when she's working on these manuscripts that are still in the editorial process, it, uh, seeing her bring her care and intelligence to that is is pretty magical and then when it gets to the edit the managing ed stage she's just so precise and able to track there's so many things to track in managing ed and I just always feel like people are being really well cared really well cared for um yeah it's fun too because I did everything and then Lindsay did most of it and now we have like all these pieces and uh Gia has professionalized things too on the managing ad and um, oh yeah she's she brought in all these incredible processes that make everything easier <laughs> it's sort of like oh my god Stephen how did we how did we get this done before <laughs> you figured all these things out yeah. well <laughs> we're just like working in all these wor random word documents with lists of things you know? yeah. let's go back though because these actually have a logic to them and, and Gia put this so the first slide is uh, recent poetry titles, 
uh, Divya Victor's Curb, which uh, won the Pen Open Book Award, Active Reception by Noah Ross, uh, was taken from the Poetry Prize, uh, Permanent Volta by Rosie Stockton, an incredible debut uh, that came after uh, Asada closed to us through one of our beloved authors, Brian Tierer. And then The Sunflower Cast is Spell to Save Us from the Boy was um, selected by one of our editors at the time and was a National Book Award finalist. And you can see the range of aesthetics from like concrete book art to Noah's book to, we'll talk a little bit about Permanent Volta to, uh, you know, snapshot from photo album to uh, really beautiful uh, illustration commissioned by Divya for her cover. And then we, next slide, we do fiction. Uh, the, we have several, uh, a couple of Harvey Guevara's book, Hervé Guibert titles, including this wonderful uh, short story, My Man, Servant, and Me, which we published last year. Uh, and then a, a beloved project, you know, of Lindsay and all of us is uh, the Camille Roy selected stories, Honey Mine, uh, with the wonderful Bambi cover by Nicole Eisenman, which Isabella Widener just wrote about in Freeze magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, Virgil Kills with this incredible sort of digital, um, and these two are risk these First three book service of Hochberger designs, all really different, but this very sort of digital neon green world. And then Andrew Durbin's first novel, MacArthur Park, with this uh, wonderful painting. Um, and it was designed by a familiar studio. And then reprints and reissues have always been at the heart of Nipo's mi mission. Our first book was a book by Fanny Howe, an essay that had been out of print. Um, called Lives of the Spirit. And when Kazamali, our founder, asked her about reprinting it, she said, that'd be great. And I have an addendum I wrote that's been in the drawer for X years called Glass Town. So our first book was the two of those, those two essays together in a single volume. And then the second book of prose was Five of Fanny's Novels, which is still in print in a beautiful edition called Radical Love. Um, and then when I came... I was really fortunate enough to work, became one of our first really visible uh, and fairly big titles. And then our two best-selling titles are on the right, The Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions, which was self-published by Larry Mitchell's Calamus Press in 1977 and features his, um, it's a fable he wrote, and then Ned Asta's wonderful illustrations. And um, we brought it uh, back into print or officially into print with a beautiful introduction by Morgan Besicius and a foreword by Tourmaline and it, it's unstoppable. We now have a tote bag. Um, it's been translated into French and Spanish. There's an opera, there's a film in the works, an audio book is coming, it's, it's been amazing. And same with Lou Sullivan. This was a project that was started by a press that closed, Timeless Infinite Light. Um, and we were lucky enough to kind of come three quarters of the way along and work with Ellis and Zach to get this book out. And it's a phenomenal um, collection of Lou Sullivan's diaries. Lou was often called the first gay trans man. And these are the most beautiful, heart-rending, um, moving stories from uh, Lou's life. And then Asado's Saint Sacred Spells just came out. Uh, we we're lucky enough to work with the estate of Asado. Um, and this is, I, lo I love this book because it's multi-genre. Multi it's got plays, short stories, and poetry, as well as a few essays, and really gathers Asado's life work. Um, he was also a really important publisher of Black Cave Poets of his time, died of AIDS in the early 90s. And then David Melnick's Nice is at the printer, wrote Bay Area, wonderful Bay Area project of a, uh, to say poet's poet, I think is, isn't is doing it justice, but uh, very kind of Bay Area niche experimental poet celebrated by the language poets who lived then sort of outside of poetry. Um, there's only one known extant interview and Noah Ross has written a beautiful uh forward and the four editors, um, Bed Friedlander being the chief, have been working on this project for 15 years. So it's a long culmination. So this is just a range of some of the sort of archival and rediscovery work. And the, the labor of these projects, like the labor of these four anthologies, um, is is a very is very different and very long term. And um these are just some of the anthologies that we've done. Again, we talked about how much work they are. But they also, you know, Nipantla, which is Queer Poets of Color, is one of our best-selling titles, is, is We Want It All. So a lot of people come to Night Boat through the anthologies.
Uh, we did a screenplay last year with Bard College for Martine Shim Show. It's just a really fun cover. Got to have some fun with this. Mm -hmm. And then we did a next slide. We did an art book with Eduardo Katz of his porn art movement, which was also fun, just sort of different genre formats. Next slide. And then maybe you want to talk about these two a little? Yeah, I think, um, so yeah, I, this, um, these are two books that I edited, basic, uh, Prescribe Me by Chalin Chang um, on the left and Teeter by Kimberly Alidio on the right. Um, Teeter just came out this past August. Um, and I was thinking, you know, these are these are two books that had sort of a complicated managing ed um, kind of backstory to them. Um, and uh, I, I feel very like grateful to be working uh, with Lindsay in particular, who was like such an amazing um, sort of like, I guess, um, just like collaborator on these projects. Um, I, I think for me, what was so fun about these projects is that in, in two different ways, they in, or in two very different ways, they are. Uh, both like Kimberly and Chalun are poets who are thinking a lot about like exophonic writing and like writing in a language that isn't like you know your mother tongue so Chalun um, I guess it, I think I think it has a lot of qualms with this uh, term but is sort of is, is an ESL poet or English is not her first language um, and I, I love the way that she uh, thinks about it though like she she talks about how English is a kind of like lover to her or like like an affair that she has or, or a medium um, and Teeter is uh, uses a lot of um, language from uh, the Filipino languages, Filipino and Pangasinan, um, which is a sort of more uh, localized language or dialect in the Philippines. Um, and I think so. Chalon was very adamant that the book is about kind of her relationship to English and a, a, a you know, and recognizing that it's not her first language but was also very, you know, adamant that this is not a, a poetry of broken English. Uh, and in a, in a similar way, like I think Kimberly was, is, it, it, uh, her relationship to Pangasinan and to Tagalog is, is, is about this kind of like uh, diasporic Filipino experience of not having, of being surrounded constantly by like your, by your, by your parents' mother tongue, but not being able to really understand it. Um, you know, I'm also Filipino. I think this is like a very, very common experience for um, for for Filipinos, uh, for Filipino Americans to not be able to understand um, Filipino. Um, and Kimberly um, associates that experience. So I, I, I mean, for me, it like totally blew my mind um, with with the experience with, with like her love for language poetry um, and a certain like sonics. Um, so I think coming from those two perspectives, like um, we had a really interesting um, and I think, uh, I don't know, just like a, like a very exciting copy editing process, which I know sounds a little yeah. bit like, uh, what's the word, like an oxymoron. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think uh, Lindsay found two amazing, um, I guess, people to, to, to copy edit uh, these books. Um, Lindsay reached out to one of uh, our, our our authors, Carrie Hunter, um, to uh, cop copy edit prescribe Um and 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 I think she did an amazing job at sort of walking that balance between not like overcorrecting or like not like standardizing Chalon's language, but also I, I I think just like fleshing it out and making sure that Chalon like sort of like th that there was intentionality behind like Chalon's choices. Um, and explaining some of the sort of intricacies of, you know, English grammar, I think things that like, I don't know if I would be able to articulate. Um, and I think right, there was- Because Carrie's a, sorry to interrupt, just yeah, that Carrie, Carrie's an ESL teacher. Mm -hmm. So she was able to articulate, yeah, just articulate yeah. and recognize the patterns, you know, like the patterns of like, you know, I don't, I don't know if they're even errors, but you know, just the, ways that it didn't match standard English and then highlight them so that Chowan could decide whether she wa wanted to to match a standard or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I think, and then similarly, you also found, oh God, I can't remember his last name, but his first name was Benino. Oh, yes. And he is a, he was a, I think a PhD student in the Philippines and a native speaker of Pangasinan. Um, and I think that Kimberly had her own concerns about somebody. I, I think uh, the Pangasinan that Kimberly uses is definitely not like a standard Pangasinan. I think a lot of it is sort of like a like a syllabic 
transcription of mm. her relationship to Pankasinan. And so I think she was pretty worried about having a, a Pankasinan like copy editor come in and fix everything. Um, but this guy was great. Like he was really like he he sort of went through and was like, you know, this is not how I would hear it. Or like I, I think he was he was he made these like really smart like uh I think edits to some of the language being like this this to me or or like I, I don't even think he touched it some of the time. He would be like, this doesn't really make any sense to me, you know. And I think it was the ball was in Kimberly's court at that point, whether or not she wanted to fix it. Yeah, I think the sensitivity of of having to find people that can actually do the copy editing and proofing of the work we do and that like that incredible matchmaking and the translation that are, uh, in terms of what is standard standard copy editing procedure versus what will work uh, with experimental poem, what will work with something that is purposely breaking the rules. Um, not only just in English, but in 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 different languages and in different versions of different languages. It's it's kind of an amazing evolving sort of um, challenge. And I think these two titles are are just they're so impressive in the way that the way those they came together and those things were fulfilled with Lindsay and Gia and the author's sort of teamwork. It was really exciting. I think we all thought it was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> And to find that right person somewhere in the world that can appreciate, it's just like, it feels like magic when it happens. Yeah, I feel like I learned so much from that process. Let's do this again. And that also happens on the covers too, that same sort of dance between, you know, author's intention versus like perception or what what the, the culture maybe thinks it should be. And um, this is like, I think one of our favorite covers internally because it had such a long story and you can read about this. Another link to drop is on our blog between Rissa Hochberger, the designer of Permanent Volta in the center, and Rosie Stockton, the author. And I think we're, we're running out of time. So I'll just say that like these are some of the references they had um, uh, from the the, Rai, the the function of the orgasm, the William Wright cover, uh, to the Lacan drawing on the bottom left, to the Dering, which is from a, a leather archive in Chicago that Rissa visited while working on this book. And the amount of back and forth between the two was just like the startling revelation. And that all came together when they knew the same tattoo artist named Mountain. And Mountain's drawing of the conglomeration is the, is that image at the top of the book cover. So I love that there was like a third party, an artist who could like bring their two minds together and then create something that we could make into this really eye-popping cover. Definitely read the interview. It's really, it's fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll drop it in a sec. Oh, I, I already dropped it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We're at two o'clock. But do tell us about these, this visually amazing. So take a, take a moment and let us know what's going on. Yeah, this is this is just kind of like a, a behind the scenes screenshot, I suppose, um, from Teeter by Kimberly Alidio. Um, and I, I just, I think I wanted to just demonstrate like kind of a dynamic that happens between our designers and our authors. Sometimes it's a more engaged process between the two and sometimes it's a little bit more like straightforward or hands-off but in this case you can see like uh Rissa Hochberger who designed it did a lot of work to translate uh Kimberly's like visual poems into into a book um and yeah I think this was very much not a straightforward process at all um and uh that this the the visual poem that you see here is based off of oh god I can't even remember what it's called but it, it's it's like a kind of like graph of sound um, and it's meant to emulate uh, that. And so these little tiny lines, like vertical lines that you can see on the image on the right, uh, that was actually Briss's contribution. Um, I think just part of like looking at the reference image that Kimberly had provided her. Um, and I think adding that um, off their own volition and Kimberly, I think, loved it. So, uh, yeah. But it creates such a great dynamic. Um, and thank you for putting all these visuals together. It really helps us uh, get the range. And you all just did a great job at giving us a sense of the enormous range of your activities and everything that goes into the various processes. So thank you all so much for that. And I'll bet there's some questions. So I'll turn it over to you, Eleanor, to organize that. Thank you, Cole. And thank you so, so much, Gia, Lindsay, and Stephen. That was so inspiring. Super, super incredible to hear about. Um, so I 
if anybody from the audience would like to add any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or um, send a message in the chat. But I wanted to ask the first question to you all. Um, so you've detailed so beautifully about the um, process of working, collaborating with authors and with artists to create these amazing books. But I'm wondering if you could speak a bit to the ways in which relationships with the authors and contributors are maintained maybe after the books are released into the world and kind of just what that looks like, what that continuity is like for you all and for them? Uh, that's a great question. And I think like any, any small press that's grown sort of over time and exponentially, like keeping track of every one you work with becomes a, a challenge so that books that um, you published 15 years ago are still part of like the overall um, life of the press. And certainly when we are able to go, you know, keeping things in print, keeping things available ends up, you know, in our changing technological time ends up being kind of a challenge because of the expense of printing and storage and uh, just like sometimes there's a translation that needs to happen from one one technology to another uh, and going to event, you know, doing events and um, and inviting backlist authors to, to AWP, for example, where we like it was the first time, like, I think we had three dozen authors together kind of in many, many years. And there was like many different generationality. And then, you know, social media and e-blast outreach and then, you um, you know, the long-term process of professionalize all the back end. So the business office of Nightfoot is in touch with authors. And that's um, something we're working on completing with a, a new um, reporting system that we're collaborating on with Coach House Press, which I think will be like the sign that we've really arrived at like some kind of like uh, permanency that we we, we can, do, can do that. Um, so... And then hope, just hoping to see people, you know, at events and in, and now that we're back together again and, you know, in conversation at a place like the Brooklyn Book Fest. But I do think that that ever evolving uh, sort of like constellation ever growing to it, it keeps expanding. It's, it's a little different from a magazine where like you, you put out an issue and then, you know, you're a generation later and it, there may not be an overlap, but the fact that the the books are still available and we are still like supporting them. We are still representing them. Um, even if they're what we call deep backlist, you know, they still should be findable on our website and you can order them for your library and buy them. So that in itself is like a continuum that I think a lot of presses work to try to figure out how to, to keep alive so that books that are 20 years old, people still know they're there and you you promote your the backlist catalog you do a sale you you bring them out we invite people to our office every december to kind of pick through everything and take stuff home that you know maybe they didn't know we'd ever published even elena do such an incredible amount of work to support our authors and through publicity and you know like event coordination and um just all of those like practical things that make books available for a long time and that just Stephen is just so good at thinking about the big picture and the long term of the life of these books so um we're all really grateful for that and just to say like one thing that I've been trying to do is bring authors back into the process later like for having some of our authors have spend screeners for the prose reading period like our prose authors or our po poetry authors will screen for the poetry prize so that feels like a nice way of like them having some you know say in the vision of the press you know that they're part of this press and that it um, um carrying it forward so thank you that was such a those were such beautiful answers thank you so much um, our next question will be from my colleague, Chloe. And again, if anybody else from the audience would like to chime in with a question, we'd love to pass you the mic. So just let us know. And Chloe, over to you. 
Wow. Thank you all so much for this conversation, which has been an absolute delight to watch. Um, my question is, uh, you know, in advance of this conversation, I was reading about your name, Nightboat. Um, and I really love the passage that you wrote about Nightboat uh, and your name and what it means to you as a press. And I was curious if what the title means to each of you individually um, in terms of how you work as a publisher and how you support writers through your work. I can go. I, I mean, I think it feels like it's a really beautiful metaphor, um, <laughs> sort of like a ferrying across a liminal space across the water. You know, I think uh, some one of our editors, um, Jay Elizabeth, has talked about it, the idea of like being a book doula. It's like there's this <laughs> you know, really kind of um, taking taking someone in your like you need to uh, I don't know if this is what Cosm had originally thought but I always think about this of like getting in the boat and then taking them across the water and then taking them to the other side and it really is such a long process and it really requires a lot of um intention and care um so that that's what kind of occurs to me and just the the nature of the work that we we all are attracted to is like very much in this sort of liminal space. Um, so. Yeah, I think I also think the whole, um, you know, Cosm came up with this like this vision and idea before any of us got here. <laughs> so it's this interesting thing of like showing up like there's three books in print or two books even and there's this like really like intense name and description of the name you know and I and I love it because it's like Cosm's mind I mean one of the things I think that really Cosm imprinted on the press is just the interest in everything like you know if you look at our founding advisory board it's like Ann Tardos, Lucille Clifton, Galway Kennel and Brenda Hellman and others I mean it's just all different perspectives of what, on what a poem is um I think Cosm's early embrace of inner genre writing and like not being like we were never a poetry only press, we're a poetry press, but that's, we, you know, we're not confined to that. And I think that the like, the kind of like full onness of the name and the like descriptive behind it is just like the ambition for form, the ambition for what a folio can be. And also really just an amazing allowance. It's like to me about possibility and the invitation here we all like are later, like we all work under that umbrella and we all sort of feel like we could do anything right like I think we all there's nothing that one of our editors couldn't bring to the table that they didn't love that we wouldn't you know really try to make happen um a piece of writing I mean language-based work but I think some some very expensive visual things we couldn't do but I do really I really do feel like it's got this capaciousness um and so many like dreams or night passages of so many ways like every single night there's a different story a different text that comes into the mind of the press and i i love that i love that about it um wow that was beautiful steven i love that <laughs> thank you yeah do you want to add yeah on? sure i mean i think for me it's like i feel like i was already like such a fan of the press before i started working here that like it feels like it feels like hard to like associate it with like the like specific like the actual texture of like the word itself it's like it feels like being like oh like what do you think of the band name like the Beatles or something it's like it's like I'm like oh it's a it's a book it's like a, it's a great press <laughs> but I think like for me it's like I, I think what I connect to is like maybe like the sense of like unknown of, of like unknowingness and like the future and like this like and like like discovery um and yeah, I don't know. I I think I think for me it would be that sense of like discovery, and I think, um, yeah, I don't know. It it, it yeah. It's also a title of a Duran Duran song I recently discovered. So <laughs> the night boat. Yeah, I always think New Directions. I didn't know that. That's funny. New yeah. Directions is such a great example because New Directions is such an it's like a nothing burger name, really. Like <laughs> if I wrote that out for a press, you'd be like. This is so like a Hallmark card, Stephen. Not quite, but but then 
when we think of it, we just think of this like towering 80 plus years of books. And like, I don't, it's just like, mm-hmm. this, it's like you, this library is in my head. It, it's like, they've made the name something that's, mm-hmm. it's so um, rich. And so like Gia was saying, it's like, since I came into literature, it's always been connected with that great list. Um, and that, and just all they've done. And so I think it's kind of amazing, like how the, the meaning and the language is like replaced by, mm. in this case, a, a, you know, a publishing program. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for all of those answers and thoughts. That was a pleasure to listen to. Um, and I'll pass it back over to Eleanor. Thank you again for this conversation today. Thank you, Chloe. That was a lovely question. And thank you all for sharing those really generous responses. Um, yeah, it's been such a treat to hear about your work at Nightboat and hear about all the amazing things that are created there. So just thank you all so much for all that you contributed today. Um, I am really excited now to pass the mic over to Gia, who will be reading some poetry to close us out today. Thank you, Gia. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I'll just start. I'll just read two very short poems. Um, and uh, yeah, this one's untitled because I wrote it last week. <laughs> From a distance, you found a way to initiate a closer encounter, a more fortuitous imposition. From a distance, a sound having been created by another more distant sound was extruded. I expound upon that distance. I insinuate that crime of imposition. I foreground myself in relation to that distant sound, which comes from no place. Wasn't it almost the form of a wave had I not been transfixed by its wavely shape? Um, and then this poem is was published actually in, um, in Noah Ross's um, uh, publication-based um, and yeah, I feel like this has been the secret Noah Ross celebration. I feel like your name has come up like a few times now. Um, yes, <laughs> like heart hands emoji, um, but it's called a drizzle of honey. A drizzle of honey is a show of recognition, a premonition of ardor, an imminence of arousal, an original stream of pearlescent address stupor distinguishing a leisure beyond, a thread through a pearl, a handkerchief in the LeMay pocket. Anger is a mode of conversation as glance is a measure of seduction, a trinity of proportion, your face surrounded by a slubby car coat, aversion to the groundbreaking works. In a short twist or done up style of hair, big wig style, preponderance of the nipples of others, nipples protruding neatly, stumpily, aghast with the consequence of reversal, an emulsion of oil and spit, a clusterfuck of idling bodies demonstrating a show of indolence in the leathered banquette. Brilliance is the sheen buffering your words might as well be how they spoke of you, at an angle to others' largesse, worldly posses. Jokes are simple axioms of meaning, truisms of a fakish world. True glasses, uh, true grasses away from the urban landscape. I wrote as if through a dream faster than thought and beyond meaning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gia. That was a lovely end to a lovely, lovely conversation. Thank you again, Lindsay and Stephen. Thank and you. Everyone. Thank you so much, Gia. That was absolutely stunning. And thank you, Stephen and Lindsay, for your readings as well, which were so beautiful. And thank you, Cole, for the wonderful questions. It's been such a lovely, lovely afternoon with you all. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC programs. And they help make these daily conversations possible. And they also support our growing archive, which now has over 900 NSCs. And you can check it out on our website or on the Rails YouTube channel. And this conversation will be up there too very shortly. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics 
through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSE. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support our work at the rail and also stay tuned for the October issue, which will be dropping in the next few days. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. if you're free for a conversation with Charlotte Kent, Saul Ostro, Ethan Bond Watts, and William Corwin in honor of Bobby Ansbach. We will conclude with a poetry reading by George for Gropolis tomorrow. Um, thank you all for tuning in and listening this afternoon. And you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you. It's great thank to you, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank, you so thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Cole. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the Thank afternoon. You. Thank, Thank you, Eleanor. You. Thank you, Chloe. Thank, Thank you, Cole. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Stay cozy. Stay cozy. <laughs>